afternoon. This is Randy Brunson with Centurion Advisory Group back for the next episode of Stewarding Family Wealth brought to you by Centurion Advisory Group. I am here today with my co-host Sandy LaRue. Sandy, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Randy. Excited to be here. Good. I'm glad you're here. Thanks to co-host engineers, the folks that actually do all the stuff. We just show up and talk, which is so cool. At any rate, appreciate you guys a lot. So you know what? The last episode... We wrapped up on the principle of uncertainty. And and a story about Sue. Sue, mm-hmm. right. And Sue was prepared for uncertainty. We talked about that the last mm-hmm. time we were together. So today, we're going to talk about three real-life examples. We're going to tell stories, mm-hmm. okay, about mm-hmm. how three separate households have prepared for uncertainty and what they've done and how they approach it, okay? But before we get to, to, to the principle of uncertainty, there's this concept let's call it the concept of diversification yes the principle of diversification Mm -hmm. all right and so many times when people think of diversification especially in the financial world they think of things like asset class diversification right which tell us more fill us in which is just really one form of diversification we identify and there may be more but we identify six categories of diversification and one is like randy mentioned asset diversification and that's typically people thinking do is it cash is it stocks bonds real estate uh, precious metals like gold or silver or Or maybe business interest yeah or business interest or diamonds I don't know. Whoops. Sorry. Di- di- <laughs> That's a great idea. Got a little distracted there. Um, and then the other one is investment class, like large or small companies. Are we investing in large or small companies um, like Walmart or what? Maybe Tesla, which I don't know if Tesla's small anymore. Um, and then domestic or international companies like Hershey's and things like that are actually over in Switzerland. So that would be considered more of an international or kind of so a combo. Like a, a Nestle is a Nestle would be an international company, right? Yeah, yeah. And so and then the other one would be bonds. We have government bonds and we have corporate bonds, which we right now So have. those are types of an investment classes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Absolutely. And then there's time frame diversity and that kind of diversification is kind of what Randy has talked about several times is general reserves. Usually people have emergency reserves or Randy has called it and, and he gets this from, um, I can't think of his name right now. Dave Ramsey has the Dave absolute Ramsey. best description mm-hmm. for emergency reserves. He says it's emergency repellent and I, I just can't improve on that description. Yeah. So we, we, we stole it from him because it works really well for what we use it for. It but does. Those are usually um, money that's less than six months. Usually, you know, we, it's a good way to... Uh, kind of what Sue did. She set it aside for those things that maybe she'd get lost her job and she needed money. That's what these general reserves are mm-hmm. really good for. And then allocated reserves, which are usually two to five year money. And that's money like if you're going to want to do some house renovations, which it sounds like everybody did that during the pandemic. So that's where those allocated reserves would come in. And usually those are positioned so that they're a little more liquid. Yeah, yeah. liquid. Yeah. yeah, a little mm-hmm. easier to get to. And then there's long-term money or long-term funds or however you want to say that. And that's usually the money you're going to learn use for financial independence or retirement depending on how you approach money but these these same concepts there would wouldn't they would also apply to a business like if if you have business operating reserves and you have 30 60 90 days of operating expenses cash on hand Mm -hmm. and then allocated reserves might be those dollars set aside to replace depreciating assets plant and equipment you know there's a reason that 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 the, the tax code allows you to depreciate those because in fact they do wear out they become obsolete they have to be replaced so the allocated reserves could literally be a, a sinking fund set aside to replace plant equipment furniture fixtures yep right yep and we we have actually a client that does that they have a rather large balance of money that they keep to buy equipment yeah. um, so it's a smart thing to do right. and then another one is liquidity and that kind of speaks to what you were talking about before which is so the cash. next category is liquidity yep. uh, diversification yeah. mm-hmm. okay and that is cash, business interest, or income producing real estate. Those are good ways also to So so cash is liquid, cash and marketable securities are liquid. Yep. And then and, and then business interest and real estate are generally less liquid, yes, right? right? So it's it's valuable to diversify across those three. Yes. And like right now, because of with inflation, real estate is a really good place to be having your money. That's a good place to so diversify into. And now would right be a now. good time to own real estate. Uh-huh. It would be ideal if you bought real estate ten years ago, right? It, it, yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> and precious metals, because now gold is ridiculous. So, yeah. Yeah. And then one of the other ways is tax diversification. And some people buy personal you know, residences so they can deduct any of the interest that's due on that um, or income producing real estate because that's a very tax efficient way to diversify. So when you look at from from a tax diversification standpoint, because so many Mm -hmm. times when when people look at taxes, they think in terms of income taxes, correct? federal and state income taxes. But if if you're evaluating a financial statement, if I'm I'm hearing you well, Mm -hmm. it's also prudent to evaluate, okay, what's my entire tax burden? Right, right. But so on on real estate, whether it's your residence or income generating real estate, you've got property taxes due. Yep. And on and cash flow, you property. take from the mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you do. Mm-hmm. And then on cash flow from the business, you could have most likely have a personal income taxes due on it. But if you take earned income, if you take a salary or some form of earned income, right. like then w- you'll also have FICA taxes, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Yep. Okay. And so there's some combination of that is ideal. Okay. Because if you don't take, like we do have business owners that we recommend they do a combination. They have some W-2 or earned income as well as distributions, distributions. Okay. just so that they can still benefit from some of the Social Security or Medicare options. And it's good to maximize yeah. that to an extent. Yeah, for a friend of mine, for example, um, has he's done well. His available cash flow is well into six figures. Mm-hmm. But he's never taken more than twenty-five thousand to thirty thousand dollars of earned income, so he's going to have a social security check that's so small he probably has to put his glasses on to see the numbers. Right, you know, it's just really small, uh-huh. and so that's not a good or bad situation as long as his CPA signs off on whatever he's doing. Right. Okay, but it's simply an awareness consideration. If if you intentionally take an extremely small salary against significant cash flow, just be advised that you are reducing your future social security benefit. All right. So that's, again, that's neither here nor there, just an awareness consideration. Right, right. And, and you just, you have to plan for that. Like right. And then from, a, then from a tax standpoint, you can also have, uh, especially with, with with retirement plans, you can also have pre-tax, uh, like IRAs and retirement plans, those kind of things, pre-tax right. assets as mm-hmm. well as after-tax assets. Yep. Yep. Right. That's the final one of those that offer tax diversification. And we, it's a good combination. It's good to do a combination of both. And then the final one is the jurisdiction and forum diversification. And that is like where you're looking at maybe getting a second passport or citizenship. Like my brother happens to lucky him. My dad was in the military. He happens to have dual citizenship, both in Bermuda and here in the states and so he can he has the opportunity to invest and do things over there and maybe get some savings or uh, tax savings or not be um, subject to some of the stuff that goes on here in the states because he has the opportunity to move there or can invest there that this would allow him to do that's one of the things and businesses this is more common for them to do that than individuals okay so with multinationals that might have manufacturing or distribution or products Mm -hmm. or services that serve a global community then it's much more common for them to forum shop to decide okay what's the ideal place for our distribution facilities our manufacturing facilities uh, from ease of access to our customer base Mm -hmm. cost of doing business tax cost employment you know hiring employees so that's a common behavior for multinationals right but the question is that Is there a place for that for the individual? And, you know, there can be. I I would, for those of you who find this idea intriguing and are asking yourselves the question, okay, so what is the benefit of owning real estate in some other part of the world or Mm -hmm. having assets in some other part of the world, and in particular having a a second citizenship or a a second, which can lead to a second passport Mm -hmm. somewhere else in the world? Two things. Number one, obtaining a second citizenship and therefore a second passport from another country is typically a function of, of either heritage, four things, either right. heritage, mm-hmm. investment, 10 year longevity, how long you've lived in a d- another country, right. or finally special skills and talents. Like if you're, if you're a, a, just a master bobsledder, let's say you're from Scandinavia, which seems to just crank out winter sports medalists, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, Jamaica will probably give you <laughs> citizenship if you'll if you'll <laughs> run on the Jamaican bobsled team, for example. Absolutely, right? yeah. Right, exactly. Mm-hmm. So, so that's just, and then most of us don't fit in that category. Most of mm-hmm. us are going to have to do it either by heritage, investment, or, or just moving somewhere and living for several years. One other consideration, mm-hmm. I would urge you with a high degree of conviction, do not give up your U.S. 
citizenship. You may like the idea of being a world traveler, being the nomad in the, in the world and just mm-hmm. living everywhere in the world. That's outstanding. I would urge you not to give up your U.S. citizenship. It is literally, it literally can be, and I'm serious as hard as that, it literally can be your get out of jail free card. Yes. Okay. So what else about that, Sandy? That is it. That those are all of, those are the six. And so again, they are asset diversification, investment class diversification, time frame diversification, liquidity diversification, tax diversification, and then finally jurisdiction and forum diversification. So those are the six that we identify. All right, so let's let's move on to talk about one of those specifically. Let's talk about time frame diversification because we wrapped up our last podcast mm-hmm. talking about Sue and, and how she had prepared well, okay, mm-hmm. for uncertainty yeah. and was able just to coast right through 2020 with enjoying life mm-hmm. uh, and actually moved moved closer to her parents because they're aging. It's a great story. But let's talk about time frame diversification and and how you and I can allocate our cash flow cash flow planning as it relates to time frame diversification so let, let's let's share some stories let me start talking about brent yeah and then if you would tell us a story about after i finish talking about brent then if you talk about mark and uh, mark and emily that'd be great so absolutely you and i were um actually we we're on a zoom call the other day yeah with with brent brent's 24 years old he's single he is a he is a designer he designs automobiles and automobile accessories using CAD, uh, computer assisted design software, and mm-hmm. has been working from home. He's what twenty four single, a Very an helpful. automobile an automobile accessories designer. Just yep. fascinating career track, mm-hmm. and he loves the outdoors. He he likes yep. the extreme outdoor stuff like mountain biking, trail running, bike. Uh, I think he yeah, bikes too. M- most of it's not motorsports. It's no. all it's all no, like, Pete and Jack powered. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, just bicycle, bikes. mountain climbing, yeah, mountain, mountain biking, mountain yeah. climbing, triathlete, those kind of things. Mm-hmm. And he, he looks, he, he presents out with physically as just he's extremely fit and yeah. loves being outside. So here he is. All right, now here's uh, Brent's situation. At a very young age, he embedded in himself outstanding oh, financial yes. habits. Mm-hmm. He said when he was 12 years old, if he wanted pocket money, he mowed the grass. You know, twelve acres for forty dollars. I thought <laughs> that'll that'll uh-huh. put you to work. And so, his situation today, he makes about sixty thousand dollars a year. Okay, every month he sets aside sixteen hundred dollars a month. What he decided is that at some point he would own a home, and so he might as well just go ahead and start setting that mortgage payment aside in cash right now, so that it was built into his habits. Oh, say, okay, so right now at the age of twenty four. Brent has about $120,000 in cash and marketable securities. Mm-hmm. And what he was trying to figure out was, okay, what does he do with this? Because his, he said he's, his 401k is invested fairly aggressively because mm-hmm. he's 24. He's not going to leave that money for decades. That he has stock options through the company he works. So he buys those through, you know, payroll deduction, employee stock ownership plan. Mm-hmm. And I said to him, I said, what, what are you, what's your comfort level with just general reserves? Right. He said, about $10,000. I said, all right, let's just earmark that. Put that in the savings account, $10,000, right? Yep. All right. Then he talked about that he would really like to buy real estate. Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, right now, we talked about real estate a minute ago. Right now is a phenomenal time to own rental real estate. Right. Or a good time to be selling real estate. Mm-hmm. Okay. You go back and read Peter Lynch, who ran Fidelity Magellan from the early 70s to the, about 91. He said, you buy when there's blood on the street. So the time you buy real estate is when everybody is selling real estate. Right now, there are four buyers for every seller. Right. So now's a good time to be selling real estate, not buying it. Mm-hmm. But Brent's aware that the market will cycle. Everything cycles. The season cycle, life cycles, everything runs through cycles. And so there's going to come a time where nobody wants to own real estate. Mm -hmm. All right. And so he wants to prepare for it. And so what we talked about, all right, let's have 10,000 in the general reserves. That's his comfort level. Mm -hmm. And then let's take that $1,600 a month that he's setting aside for a future mortgage payment. And let's, you know, in two years, he'll have another 40,000, roughly another $40,000. Let's set that aside in a savings or maybe in a a portfolio CD, a, a CD proxy. Mm-hmm. You know, where we can design something, a short bonds, it's going to throw off, maybe generate 2% a year, something like that. But typically, let's preserve this, have it grow just a tad, but preserve this so that in the next 24, 36 months, 
real estate market cycles, if it does, mm-hmm. and he finds something he wants to buy, he'll have cash on hand to make a significant down payment, right? Mm-hmm. And then he's got about 60000 cash on hand. The other 50000 we're going to invest it long term. It can be like 100% equity or 100% stock portfolio that, that will serve him long term. And, you know, you think about the 10000 and, you know, it, is 10000 enough, too much, too yeah. little, yeah. those kind of things? What did he tell us? He, he went out to he went out to do some mountain climbing in the Mountain West in Colorado or oh, yeah. Idaho or somewhere. Mm-hmm. He was gone for two or three weeks. Mm-hmm. What did he spend? About a dollar and a half. Yeah, barely anything. Yeah, he, he said he he camped and slept in his car. Yeah, he said it was very inexpensive. So I mean, he's twenty four and single. He doesn't have to take a shower for weeks and months, you know. But yeah. but th- that kind of thing. So so in his case, probably ten thousand is a is a is an adequate reserve that that he could literally get oh. by on if you lost a job mm-hmm. for three, four, five months. Yeah, yeah. Now, that's every household is different, but that's yeah. a Brent story, right? Mm-hmm. So there was the general reserves, about 10000 There was the allocated reserves to capitalize on opportunity yep. in the next two, three, or four years. And then there was a the long-term money mm-hmm. that would secure his and his future family's future, right. lay the foundation for financial independence, options in work life, some of those kind of things. Right. Right. Yeah. Is that what we heard. Yeah, because his four hundred one k and then that fifty thousand is his long term money. Okay. Yeah. All right. So he's in his twenties now. Tell us about Mark and Amy. Mark and Amy are what forty five to four, uh, uh, Mark and Emily are forty five to forty seven. Uh, a little later than that. He's okay. almost fifty, and she's oh, like, like cr- um, closing up, cr- uh, cruising yeah. up on fifty. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. I was like, well, oh, tell, yeah, yeah. Tell us about Mark and Emily. Um, well, he's a code writer. So okay. all these programmers, they have two children in private school, two girls. One's 11 and the other's about 14. Okay. And they're really good about putting money aside for the girls' private, ed- you know, the private school education. So they take advantage of that. They have no debt. So their home is paid for. Uh, yep. Their home is completely paid for. And they still, and he budgets, he he. He, they run their numbers every year. They know exactly what their numbers are. He knows exactly wherever Penny goes, doesn't oh, he? He does. He's very well allocated <laughs> in terms of how he spends his money. And they make plans. Like they want to go on a big vacation or an anniversary vacation. They budget for it. Well, their 25th is coming up. Mm-hmm. And don't they have like one of these big, huge international trips in, yeah. in mind? Yeah. They're, they're so fun. So their general reserves is about thirty grand because they, you know, they're so well budgeted. But you just never know. So they have about thirty thousand dollars in general reserves or emergency reserves. If well, there's, you will. there's four of them for one thing, yep. and they already own, own a home, so their general reserves, their comfort level is more than the ten thousand that Brent had. Right. But okay. there's four of them. But it, that is just to cover those everyday living expenses. I sure. think that's what that's for. Okay. And then he has got about $100,000 in allocated reserves. One is for this that big anniversary trip. They have two autos, so they budget for to replace their autos. They drive them a long time, and they put money aside, like an auto fund, if you will. And they also have, um, like, home renovations they've done just to keep their house up to date. So all of that is in their allocated reserves. So the way Mark and, the way Mark and Emily approach it, I know Mark, mm-hmm. Mark puts himself in charge of a lot of this. Emily just enjoys the experience. Yeah, she trusts him completely. Yeah, yeah. She, enjo- she, enjoys, mm-hmm. she enjoys taking care of her children. She has yep. a special needs brother. They help out there some, some of those kind of things. Yeah. So, so if I heard you well, Mark and Emily, they've got, Allocated reserve of about a hundred thousand. Uh-huh. That's going to cover the major anniversary trip, some home renovations they have in mind, and will allow them to pay cash for there the, any auto the, the mm-hmm. two two uh, two vehicles that need to be replaced in the next two to three years. Yep. Okay. Yep. And then in addition to that, they never have about another hundred thousand in cash. Oh, and they always have a a good chunk of money in yeah, cash. Yeah, and, anyway, and go ahead. Always, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, and they're always good about putting money aside. They have regular reoccurring contributions monthly, and they have that set up. And then he also sets up and pays money, puts money aside, I should say, long term, regularly, not as regularly as the those regular money that he has going in every month. This is in addition to that. Mm-hmm. And so they have such great habits. And it's, and it's a fairly large sum they put away because he, he earns money and they, they live well, but not mm-hmm. excessive. Yeah, no, they, they certainly enjoy life. They've traveled, mm-hmm. a, they've traveled a good bit. They're very generous, very involved in the church and things like this. The, yep. uh, just because he's been setting money aside for 25 years, they have about, what, $900,000 yep. yep. fully invested for the future because he, he wants an early out. He, he wants the option yep. of stepping away from full-time work by the time he's 55 to 58. 55, yeah, mm-hmm. 55 in, in to range? 60, and, and he's, they're pretty close. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And so in addition to that 900 plus that they have that's invested long term, they have, a, and in addition to the allocated, they have about another 100000 in cash. And so yeah. what 
And they put aside about forty to fifty thousand dollars a year for long term. Rather than than investing that all at once. That's w- why they do the regular. They have so they're setting aside a couple th- averaging. Setting aside a couple thousand dollars a month so that markets up, markets down. Yeah. It doesn't matter. They're just consistently setting aside. And yep. What what's been your experience? Has that been a good way to to maximize return on a on that has assets? served them well, and we have found that has served a lot of our clients well. That money going in, because so many times we have clients that are worried about dropping a bunch of money at the same time. Other than when the market was down, um, they've been worried like how do we diversify and how do we do that? But by putting it in over time and having those regular deposits, then you're like you said, buying high and buying low, you get a good diversification. Yeah. So then your long term return is very favorable, and it has worked. We've We've had some of our clients do extremely well, even in this market where all of the a lot of the securities are su- the prices are super inflated. Right. So what's so interesting about uh, about Mark and Emily though is that you know his his business revenue ebbs and flows. He's self employed. He's, right. he's, he's runs mm-hmm. it through a sub house, but he's self employed, and his income averages about. 200 a year. Yep. Okay. But he's seen years where it's a little slower, maybe it's 150 or 160. This is gross business revenue that he right. has to cover some expenses from and then mm-hmm. take care of his family. And then there have been years it's been 250 plus, just yep. a lot more he bills by the hour on a contractual basis. And and so there's an ebb and flow to the revenue. And yet, with a 30000 in general reserves, with cash on hand to cover pretty much all the next two to three years of major expenses, uh, yeah. he can just go to work. And if it's he bills more hours this year that's fine if he bills less next year it doesn't matter there's this preparation Mm -hmm. reserves and preparation causes anxiety about uncertainty to go away it doesn't matter you're prepared yeah it's so like you said it's time frame it's not just asset diversification it speaks back to what we had said before but also time frame they have time and so they're putting money away and then how they put it away has been very beneficial to them like yeah. regularly consistent and then they have other sums that go in if and as they can which for him it it is and he can yeah well they're just they're just, they're just yeah. incredible they're incredible to work with wonderful people we've had mm-hmm. the opportunity to serve them now for three three plus years and then uh, tell you about one of the couple the, the name is harold and uh linda mm-hmm. Great we, couple. by the way we, we've changed all the names to protect the innocent yeah and uh, if they're guilty we're not aware of it but we've certainly changed the names to protect all the innocent but i'll tell you about harold and linda harold and linda are in their mid-60s or roughly mona Teresa's age and uh we have known them almost 30 years Okay, and they came to us when they were. And this is going to give some of you in your thirties a lot of hope. Okay, mm-hmm. and the purpose of sharing these stories is to give you hope, to share some, uh, help you to create a mental visual of. Okay, that's my story. You know what? I can do this. Mm-hmm. You yeah. can. You absolutely. I promise you, you can do this. So Harold and Linda came to us. They were in the mid to late thirties. It was the early nineties, and they'd been married about five years at the time. They have no children. They they made a decision not to have children. And they had together about two hundred thousand dollars. Okay, mm-hmm. Harold's goal was to retire when he was fifty-five, and they were both corporate. Both worked for very large companies. He worked in sports marketing. She worked in some big company, very mm-hmm. extremely well-known company. So I'll say I'll spare the name. And Harold retired. In the fall of 2009, now keep in mind that the whole world fell apart in the minds of many people in the fall of 2008 and early early 2009 during the Great Recession, okay? Mm -hmm. All the big financial institutions started going away and having challenges and asking Congress for bailouts because they made stupid decisions and then they wanted somebody else to pay for it. So, okay, enough political commentary. (laughs) Let's keep moving. But he retired in the fall of 2009, Mm -hmm. and they drove across the country, their vehicles, their cats, and what they had not shipped already from Ponte Vedra to Montana, where they'd built a home on top of a mountain, beautiful home on top of a mountain, which was paid for before they finished it, paid for as they built it, by the way. And he was 51 years old. He retired at the age of 51 against a target of retiring at 55. She retired 45 days ago. She Mm -hmm. retired in April. All right. But she liked to work, which is why. She, she enjoyed work. It was a great experience for mm-hmm. her. It was, she had a great time with it. But, you know, she's aged out. Time for her to go. They want to do some other things. All right. So she made just, I'm, I'm, I'm giving some income ranges here to bring perspective to this. Right. You don't have to make hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars a year. Her base and bonus was, base was about 90, bonus is 30, 35. His base and bonus in the last several years of his work with base and bonus about 175. 
Okay, so yeah. they'd done well. They'd prepare themselves well. And they did well, but they weren't making five, six, eight hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars a year. Okay, and at the moment, their home, their home was paid for, and outside of their home, they have total assets to support themselves for the next 35, 45 years, however long they live, and of more than yes, of more than three and a half million dollars. Mm-hmm. Now, here's what they have. Here's how they have set, sort of um, allocated their dollars. They keep a general reserves of about $50,000. Yeah. It's okay. It's a comfort thing for them. Right. It, yeah. it's, it's a comfort thing for them. Do they need it? That's no. where they're comfortable. Mm-hmm. They keep a re- reserve of $50,000. They have a beautiful two-story A-frame at a 7,000-foot elevation that overlooks a range of the Sierra Nevadas. It's just stunning. Yeah. Okay. And he showed the, us. And the property China. takes them up. <laughs> keep, yeah, it's beautiful. Okay. Uh-huh. In addition to that, they have... $700,000 in allocated reserves. Now, in their case, the purpose of the allocated reserves, it is structured to be a, let's call it a CD proxy, okay? Right. D- the structure of that portfolio, heavy on short bonds, but is to generate about 2% a year, okay? But the, the purpose of it is to cover their monthly cash flow needs, whatever their monthly cash flow needs are, in addition to Social Security, that bucket is designed to cover their cash flow needs between now and the time they reach required minimum distribution age from their IRAs, which right now is 72. There's noise in Congress about moving that up to age 75. Stay tuned for more on that as, as we learn about new legislation. We will certainly let you know either on the podcast or in writing or both. But that 700000 is designed first and foremost for stability and to be available to draw against as they need to supplement cash flow. So that's the purpose of that allocated reserve is to cover the next seven or eight years of cash flow needs. Right. Okay. Then the other $3 million is the long-term money. They're not going to need that until well into their 70s, and so that can be allocated for more of a long-term building. The reason they are comfortable doing that is they have prepared very well. You and I have looked at these numbers mm-hmm. every year for years. Yes. And assuming that Social Security will be available to them, which I fully expect it to be, mm-hmm. they have two dollars of assets for every dollar that they need. So it's it's so the, the long term money that other three million can just ebb and flow. The the market value can ebb and flow with years, knowing that long term it will it will serve them very well. Now, what's interesting is to to reach that three and a half million, they did not receive huge inheritances. No. Absolutely. In fact, it was just the opposite. They were the backstops on both sides of the family, mm-hmm. okay, in, in case the families needed help. Okay, they didn't have to, but neither was there any major inheritance. All they did was they embedded all of the habits that you have heard us talk about in all these podcasts. They consistently mm-hmm. set money aside. They consistently saved. They were extremely careful with debt. They put themselves in a position where they could pay cash for their cars. And so they live well, but they are not extravagant. They lived well within their means and were very careful with how they allocated their cash flow so they could have a general reserves, a specific allocated reserve for a specific purpose, as well as some long-term money. So that's uh, those are just some stories we're sharing today. What, what else, Sandy? You know, when you were sitting there talking about that, I was thinking about Roy and Linda, you know, from Illinois, mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know, and how their situation starting at 50 – um, together, yeah, was a neat story as well. Just to be encouraging, you know, they didn't start at thirty; they started at fifty. 50. And now, granted, he has a pension, but they have done extremely well. Had to start over, and we may have talked about them during this podcast at some point. But just to encourage everybody, it's never too late. They, that's right. They start over. Second marriage for each four children, high school and college. At that point, mm-hmm. that's twenty five years ago now, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. And they they basically started over com- completely over financially yeah. they had nothing and and right they prepared that they they just were very diligent they started over at this point they're retired they're very comfortable financially yeah. and have no no financial concerns so i mean just we can tell story after story but what we want to communicate is that top call decisions good habits and being intentional you can a- accomplish anything financially that you choose to accomplish Well, hey, we're going to wrap up this uh, episode of the Stewarding Family Wealth podcast offered and brought to you by Centurion Advisor Group and hosted by our phenomenal friends at Gwinnett Business Radio X. You can find us at iTunes, 
Spotify and the High Heart Radio. We are here. We exist to serve you, help you make great decisions at the intersection of life, business, and money, transferring dollars and values across generations, paying less in taxes, and making sure that your investments line up with your values. If you want to talk more, shoot us an email. We're easy to find, centurionag.com. That's it for today. We'll talk soon.